So that's great because actually one of the things I'm going to be talking about today is getting a little bit more than you expect. That's one uh, small part of the message that we're going to be sharing today. Uh, so we are continuing as to talk about journeys, to talk about the, uh, the story of the Exodus, and today we're going to talk about the tabernacle. And if you don't know what the tabernacle is, the tabernacle was a giant tent that uh, God gave the people that they were going to worship him in, okay? So we're going to get to that in a few minutes, but I realized, um, uh, so I was thinking about, you know, parts of that message, and, and, uh, and a little bit we're going to talk about how sometimes we in our life uh, try to do things for ourselves and uh, try to copy the things that God wants to give us, but we do it, try to do it ourselves, make our own copy, and it doesn't always work out for the best. So I haven't used any pictures or videos in a while, so I came up with something that, um, I didn't come up with it, but uh, there's, there's a thing that's going around the internet. Uh, the internet has these little fads or things that kind of go around and get passed around, and they're called memes. And I don't know what the origin of that word is, but that's what they're called. And so this is a meme that's going around the internet, and it's called Nailed It, okay? So if you are not familiar with uh, Nailed It, what this is is when people will take something and try to copy it or do it themselves. So maybe like a recipe, like an interesting recipe, or they're trying to build something or uh, make a costume. And very often when the people do this, it does not end well, you know? And so what they have taken to doing is they will take a picture of the original thing and then they'll take a picture of what they did. And no matter how horrific it is at the end, uh, they will then caption the picture, nailed it, okay? <laughs> so, uh, here are a few examples of that. The first one uh, is a guy who tried to make some Cookie Monster cupcakes, and here's, <laughs> here's how they turned out, right? So, <laughs> the... Uh, <laughs> We've maybe all done this at home when you've tried to make a recipe. So the next one also is another cupcake one I found. Uh, and so uh, these little lambs the guy was trying to make. And so this is how that one <laughs> turned out. Okay. So this next one is probably my favorite one ever. And uh, <clears throat> it is based off, there's a movie, maybe you guys heard of it. The movie's called Life of Pi. And uh, it's about this Indian boy that goes on a journey in a boat with a tiger, okay? And so here's a guy recreating a picture from the movie Life of Pi. I love it. <laughs> ah, the cat does it for me, you know, that's... So, and I have one more, this one final last one. Now, unfortunately, this next one's a little hard to see, so uh, bear with me on that, but I'll tell you why I'm still showing it, even though it's a little hard to see. But the next one is a guy, we're all familiar with Iron Man, right? One of my favorite superheroes, and a uh, new movie out. And so here's a guy uh, trying to make his own Iron Man costume uh, that he wore, literally wore, to like a comic book convention somewhere. And here's how... <laughs> Here's how it turned out. So <clears throat> I learned two things um, from these nailed it uh, pictures, okay? And the first thing I learned was that uh, no matter how hard we try, sometimes we just simply fail to be able to do things ourselves or fail to be able to copy the thing that we want in our life. And then the second thing I learned, now granted, some of these, like the Life of Pi guy, he knew, you know, he wasn't, he was doing that for comedic effect, but, um, but like this guy actually wore that to a comic book convention. So at some point in his brain, he made this costume, and even though it's awful, at some point he thought to himself, you know, this is good enough for me to wear. And so sometimes when we try to copy things in our own life or do things in our own life, even when they don't turn out well, we still end up thinking in our minds, nailed it, you know, even though we missed it uh, by a mile. So we're going to come back to this. You'll see how this fits in with the message. But uh, before we start talking about the tabernacle, 
I want to go back a little bit before that, okay? I want to go back before the tabernacle. And uh, in fact, I want to go back uh, before the Exodus. In fact, I want to go all the way back to the garden. I want to go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve in the garden. This is important for us to understand because we learn from the story of Adam and Eve in the garden that this, that the garden that is, is how we were created to live. That's where God created us. He created Adam and Eve there. Humanity grew up out of that experience. Uh, he went and we lived in the garden in a state of perfection. There was no sin. Uh, there was no evil. Uh, people experienced no pain, no suffering. Uh, there was, in the world around them, there was no death. Uh, there was, you know, no problems. They lived in perfection, and what's equally important as to their living in perfection is the idea that they also lived in the presence of God. The Bible tells us that Adam and Eve actually walked with God in the garden. They spent time together. They hung out. This is how present God was with them. And it's into that life that we were created. That is the life that we were created for, to live in perfection in the presence of God. Now, we all know the story, of course, of what happened after that. Uh, after that, uh, the devil came, and he tempted Adam and Eve, and they disobeyed God. They sinned. And as soon as they sinned, they lost both of those two things. As soon as they sinned, they lost their perfection, and they lost the ability to be present with God. Because as soon as they sinned and God came the next time, what did they do? They hid. And they covered themselves up because they could no longer be in his presence. And so then, because of the consequences of their actions, the consequences of their sins, God cast them out of the garden, cut off from his presence, cut off from that perfect life, and now forced to live in a world where there is pain, where there is death, where there is suffering, where we must labor and work and sweat and toil and all of those things. The thing is that that's not the life we were created for. And I think deep down inside, um, way down inside of us, you know, in our DNA, if you will, we know that. We remember the life that we were created for. We remember that perfection and the presence of God. And when we don't have it, there's an emptiness inside of us. And we innately realize and understand that we want to get back to where we're supposed to be. We want to get back to that perfect life. We want to get back to the presence of God. We want to get back to the garden. So I have to be honest with you that when I was working on this message, I was inspired very much so by an old song. Uh, a song by a group of guys, maybe you've heard of them, named Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. And uh, they wrote this song called Woodstock. And the song was on the surface uh, just about them going to that famous concert of the same name, Woodstock. Uh, but if you listen uh, to the lyrics of the song, a lot of it is about trying to get back to that life that we know we're supposed to have. In fact, the words of the chorus are this. Now, now these guys were like giant hippies, you know, so bear with me. Uh, but the words of the chorus were this. Uh, we are stardust. We are golden. Uh, we are billion-year-old carbon. But we've got to get ourselves back to the garden. That's the chorus to this song. And they sing it that same way every time except for the last time. And then they change it up and it fits even better when they change it up because they change it to this. We are stardust. We are golden. We are trapped in the devil's bargain. And we've got to get ourselves back to the garden. Now, I love that. First of all, just a great song, just a great rock and roll song. If you haven't heard it, YouTube it. It's great. Uh, but I also think that chorus, the way they sing it, does such a great 
job of expressing that desire that we each have within us to get back to that life that we were created for. The problem comes uh, not when we have that desire, but the problem comes when we try to fulfill that desire ourselves. A couple weeks ago, as we were going through this series and uh, talking about the Exodus a few weeks ago, Pastor Paul talked about the golden calf. That's exactly what this was. The people knew they wanted a relationship with God. The people knew they needed an answer for the emptiness that was within them. They knew they needed forgiveness of sins. They wanted to feel better about themselves and to feel like they were in a relationship with God. But Moses spent so long up on the mountain, they didn't even know if he was coming down anymore. So finally, what do they decide to do? They decide to do it themselves. They say, we want to be present with God. So tell you what, we'll just make a golden calf. And then we'll say, there's our God that led us out of Israel. And whenever we want to feel present with him, we can just hang out in front of this golden calf. And then, uh, and we want to feel better about ourselves and, uh, and, and feel, fill up this emptiness that's inside of us. So uh, to worship, uh, we'll just all get drunk and like have a big party and engage in debauchery and all of that. And then momentarily, we'll forget about the pain in our life and we'll forget about the sins in our life and we'll feel better. And so they do this thing that's like a horrible copy of what God really wants for their life and they do it all and then they think to themselves, nailed it right? And then Moses comes down off the mountain and says, no. And there's a time of cleansing. But God, see, God knows how to give good gifts to his people. And so he knows we have a need to be with him. He knows we have a need to be in his presence. He knows we need forgiveness and healing and wholeness. And so he gives it to the people, and he tells them about the tabernacle. Now, if you want to turn with me to Exodus chapter 25. Now, he talks about the tabernacle for like 50 chapters. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but it's a long time. And uh, he goes over everything, like how you're going to construct it, what wood you're going to use, what fabric you're going to use, everything that's going to go in it, how you're going to furnish it. He goes over the whole sacrificial system, how you're going to worship, who the priests are going to be, he does everything. We're just taking one tiny little segment of that. In fact, we're even jumping around because the one thing I want to focus on and I want you to listen for as we read this is that the whole point of the sanctuary, of the tabernacle, is that God is going to be present there. So listen for that as we read these verses. So it starts in verse 8. Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. And then I'm going to jump down to verse 20. And here he's describing the Ark of the Covenant. And he says, The cherubim are to have their wings spread upward, overshadowing the cover with them. The cherubim are to face each other. Those are like angels, by the way, if you didn't know. Um, Are to face each other, looking toward the cover. Place the cover on top of the ark and put in the ark tablets of the covenant law that I will give you. There, above the cover, between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the covenant law, I will meet you. I will meet with you and give you all my commands for the Israelites. Uh, There's a name for that place that God was supposed to meet them. They called it the mercy seat. And so here God gives them this tabernacle. And he says to them, look, you seek after my presence? You want to get back to the garden? You want to find forgiveness and healing? Here's the tabernacle. And I promise that I will dwell here, that you can find me here, that you can find my presence here. And through this uh, sacrificial system that I'm instituting, you can come here and you can atone for your sins and you can find forgiveness and you can find healing and you can find wholeness. In fact, what he was giving them was a little bit of the garden right there. In fact, you don't have to turn there because we're jumping around a little bit, but that's that Hebrews chapter 8 verse 5. That's what that says. 
it says that the tabernacle is a copy of what is in heaven. And that's why God was so exact with like how to make it when he gave his instructions to Moses. It's a copy of what's in heaven. And I realize that heaven and the Garden of Eden aren't exactly the same things, but conceptually, they're the same. Both are the places where we live in perfection in the presence of God. And so the writer of Hebrews is saying that in the tabernacle was a little bit of that. You found perfection through the forgiveness of your sins and healing. And you found the presence of God who promised to dwell there. What a great lesson for us in how to seek God. Because we so often want to seek him in our own ways. And sometimes we don't even know what we're seeking for. Sometimes we just know there's an emptiness inside of us. Sometimes we just know that, man, this, there's got to be something more than this life. That the way I'm living, that the way I feel, this doesn't feel like how I was created to be. And so a lot of times we want to make our own things to find that fulfillment. To be quite honest, this is oftentimes uh, the, re- the justification, the motivation behind people that have addiction. Because they're trying to compensate for something that's missing in their life. And so they keep seeking after something that at least for that moment makes them feel a little bit better. But it's never enough. It's never good enough. It's never the real thing. And so they keep seeking after it and seeking for more and more and more and more. I think there's a story that illustrates this from the New Testament. Um, It's the story of the Samaritan woman at the well. It's found in John chapter 4. So Jesus goes there and asks this woman to draw water for him and all of that, and they get in this conversation. And uh, at a certain point in verse 16, Jesus says this to her. He told her, go, call your husband, and come back. She replied, uh, or I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, you're darn right you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man you have now isn't really your husband. Uh, So, what you said is true. Now, scholars have debated over whether or not this whole thing about husbands is just kind, kind of a euphemism for the fact that, you know, like maybe she was a prostitute. But the truth is, it doesn't really matter. If that she was a prostitute, or, uh, or it was exactly what it sounds like, like a type of serial monogamy, where she keeps going from one relationship to the next, to the next, to the next. What I see when I read that is someone that has an emptiness in their life and is trying to fill it up with men, trying to fill it up with relationships. She keeps thinking to herself, this is finally what's going to make me whole, is when I'm with this person. And then she gets with that person, and of course it doesn't make her whole. And so they get divorced or whatever, and she moves on to the next one. Finally, this one will make me whole then. But that doesn't make her whole, so she moves on to the next one, and to the next one, and to the next one. It's not working. And it's not what God wants For her life. And I think she recognizes this when Jesus calls her on it and says, Hey, I know what you've been doing. I think she recognizes what she really is searching for because she goes on to talk about finding God in worship. In verse 19, she says, Sir, um, I can see that you are a prophet. Um, Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. It's as if she's saying, like, look, I'm looking for God, and we worship on this mountain, and I haven't found him there. And and the Jews say we've got to go to Jerusalem, but I don't think I'm going to find him there either. This is really what I want. I'm searching for that relationship with God. That's the reason for all these husbands. And so then Jesus says to her, Woman, uh, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. 
You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and has now come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. When um, my wife and I first got married, and for our first anniversary, I think I might have told you this part of the story before, uh, I've told you we're into camping. And so for our first anniversary, we bought some camping gear. Um, But I don't think I told you the rest of the story, which is how we got the tent that we have, which we still have today. Uh, So we ordered, uh, we went online, and I think like Sports Authority or something, and uh, we ordered an 8x8 tent because that was what we could afford and because we thought that was plenty big, you know, for the two of us. And so we waited our five to ten business days, and the package shows up in the mail, and we open it up, and it's the 10 by 10 tent, which was like 30 or 40 dollars more than the one we wanted. And they had billed us for the 10 by 10. And so we were a little bit frustrated because we knew we checked our order, you know, our email confirmation. We knew we had ordered the right one. And so uh, uh, we called them up, and we said, "Hey, you guys sent us the wrong tent. We wanted the eight by eight. And um, so they said, all right, here's what we're going to do. They said, uh, just keep the 10 by 10. We'll refund the money for that one, charge you for the 8 by 8. And then for the hassle, we'll refund you your shipping, which was like five bucks. So uh, we, we check our bank account or whatever, whatever credit card or whatever a few days later. And um, they had charged us for the 10 by 10 tent, but they never charged us shipping or anything else. So what they did when they went back was they refunded us the money for the tent. They refunded us the $5 shipping that they had never charged us in the first place. And then they never charged us for the 8x8 tent. And so, I mean, we contacted them. We sent them a couple emails, like, telling them about the situation. Never heard back from them. So we got a 10x10 tent, and they paid us $5. (laughs) This is what our relationship with Jesus Christ is like. We go through life and we know something is missing and we think to ourselves, if only I had that 8x8 tent, I would be fulfilled. And I am willing to pay for that too. I know I can afford it. And Jesus comes into our life and he says, you know what, I'm giving you the 10x10 tent and I'm paying you $5. You see, she asked, Where do I find God? Do I worship him on the mountain? Do I worship him in Jerusalem? What do I do? I'm looking for God. And he says, neither of those things. We worship in spirit. And I am the Messiah, the one who is bringing healing and forgiveness to the people and restoring their relationship with God. And Jesus brings us the garden. In fact, in many ways, like he is the garden. Because Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's the presence of God. And just as the tabernacle was better than what came before it, and the temple was better than the tabernacle, and then Jesus was better than the temple, Jesus then says, and I'm going to send you something even better. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, and guess where that is going to dwell? Guess where he is going to dwell? Within you. And so now, not only do we get to experience the presence of God, but he lives in us. And he brings us forgiveness, and new life, and he heals us, and he fills up that emptiness that is inside us more than we could ever ask for. And, cheesy though it may be, you knew I was going to say it when I started this message, he nailed it. (laughs) So in Jesus' name, 
Amen.